Today's topic will be, are you dead or are you alive? I want to incorporate that into the church and into our own lives. See, Jesus, while he lived, he was more combative to the religious leaders than he was to the sinners. Jesus held his strongest rebuke to those that thought they were self-righteous. Jesus confronted those that thought they were better than everyone else. So our topic today is found in Luke chapter 11, which is one of the strongest chapters of the Bible, talking about the religious leaders of the day. And what we as a church have to guard ourselves from being is being that church of yesterday, the church of legalism or the church of the Pharisees. See, because sometimes we get so caught up in rules and regulations and rituals, we forget that God came to redeem mankind from their sin. And if we forget what God has called us to do, we have lost the power of God within our life and within the church. This last few weeks, we've been studying different things and different topics. And I believe as a church, the topic that we're going to talk about today and if we can apply it properly, can absolutely change the way the church and the way that we look at people. Because there are some times in our life that we are so pharisaical. We look at others as less than us. And sometimes we come to church and we dress up and we spend more time wearing our nice clothes than we do about the inner part of our life. And we come to church after dressing up, but we haven't talked to God about what he wants to speak to us about. And today I want to talk about some of those pharisaical, dead, religious mindsets. And some of you may say, well, that's the way it should be. But I'm telling you today, this is not what God wants it to be. God cares more about our heart and about how we respond to people than he does about our outward appearance, about our way we look or what we act like. So let me give you the first one. Outward appearance is more important than inner purity. See, the Bible says in Luke, and he, as he spoke, a certain Pharisee asked him to dine with him. So he went in and sat down to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, he marveled that he had not first washed for dinner. Now, it's not washing his hands. And that's something that we should always do before we eat dinner. But the ritual was this. They had about an egg and a half full of water. And they would pour water over their hands and let it run down to their wrists. And then they would shake it off. You know what that ritual is like? That means if I came in contact to a sinner, if I touched something that a sinner touched, I am clean. And you know what? Jesus says, that's what I'm here to do. I am here to touch sinners' lives. But the Pharisee said, no, no, no. If I even touch a sinner, if I do what a sinner has done, I am unclean, so there has to be a ritual. There's nothing biblical about this ritual. It was just something that Jesus said, what you are doing has nothing to do with what I am doing. And Jesus says, I will not play your game. Jesus came to seek and to save those which were lost, not those that are saved, not those who are religious. It is harder for a religious individual to become a saved because we think that we have it all together. We think we know the Bible. We think we have everything together. And Jesus says, I am not playing your ritualistic game. What I care more about than rituals is the relationship of inner purity. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, you've heard this scripture many times. The Lord does not look at the outward appearance, but he looks at the heart. Well, God cares more about than your rituals cares about your relationship. 
And sometimes we care more about what we look like than we care about being prepared for God to speak to us. And God doesn't look at the outward appearance. And somebody say amen to that, right? But God cares more about the heart. And when we care more about the heart, we are moved with compassion. When somebody's failing, when somebody is hurting, when somebody is broken, we have compassion for them. We don't kick them to the curb. But as a church, if we're not going to be pharisaical, what we're going to be is relational. And if we're relational, just like we talked about a few weeks ago, this church is a dysfunctional church. Somebody give me an amen. amen. We all have our dysfunction. We all have our anxieties. We all have our stress. In our Sunday school today, we talked about some of our anxieties that we have. And you know what we are? We're a bunch of families that need Jesus. And aren't we so happy that this church or any church doesn't stand up and say, you have to be like this. You have to dress like this. You have to act like this. You have to read 30 verses a day. It would be great. But we don't measure up to that. And sometimes churches become so legalistic that they believe certain things. And if somebody doesn't rise to their belief, they're less than. And Jesus does not believe that. Jesus wants to look deeper than the appearance and deeper than what we think or what we say. He wants to look at the heart and the intent. So the second thing is ritual acts are more important than a personal relationship with God. Ritual acts. In verse 42 it says, But woe to you Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and all manner of herbs and pass by justice and the love of God. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. He's saying, he's saying you guys are so pharisaical. You, people are hurting and people need a relationship with God and people need your influence, but you care more about your rituals. They were, they were as legal. I, now, this is where I wish we were pharisaical, okay? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play this game here a little bit. The Pharisees tithed everything that they had, a tenth percent. They were so ritualistic, they even tied their garden to the temple. Now, I'm saying don't be pharisaical, but at the same time, I want you to be pharisaical. <laughs> but he said this. He said, you worry about your outward appearance of what you give and what you do. You're thinking you're so much better. But people around you that are dying and going to hell, and you don't care. What do you think God as a preacher, I should never say this. What do you think God wants more? Your money or your heart? He wants your heart. And it's a matter of the heart. When he gets your heart, your money is just stuff that you have. It's something you give so other people can have a relationship. The Pharisees looked at, look what I do for God. How You couldn't do this without me. And God says, I don't need you. I can do anything I want to do through the people that have a heart for me. It is not about your money and it's not about your tithe. Although God called us to do that, it's not about your money. It's about your relationship with me. It's about your heart. It's about your compassion. It's about can you see through people's hurts and can you love them and help them no matter what's going on in their life. And if you can do that, God looks at that more important than anything else. In Micah chapter 6 verse 8, he has shown you, O oh man, not old man, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Not to be arrogant, not to think you're better, but to walk humbly before God. Is that what the Pharisees did? Were they humble before God? No. They were arrogant before God. They thought they were better than anybody else. And Jesus says, your religion is dead. I've come to make a new covenant. And the covenant that I'm giving to you is love and mercy and humility. And that covenant that I'm going to give to you is the way my church is going to be. And I cannot bless my church unless my church is humble and not arrogant. The third thing 
Being seen by others is more important than serving God. By being seen by others. And in verses 43 through 44, this is what the Pharisees did. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love the best seats in the synagogues and greeting in the marketplaces. Woe to you scribes and Pharisees and hypocrites, for you are like graves which are not seen. And when men who walk over them are not aware of them. That's another ritual. And we go to cemeteries and, and to walk onto a grave is something that is not ethical. It's not even something that we should do. But we're not a guilty of their sin if we do it. But they say that we're walking on, you're like walking on graves and, and you're better than everybody else and they don't care. And what he is saying here is, he said, it's not about your position. There's going to be things that you goof up. There's going to be times in your life that you're not going to be perfect. You are going to meet unsafe people. You are going to have to change your life. But what you want is you want to set at the best place. You want somebody to walk in and the old Baptist church, and we all do this, and you sit at the same, sit at the same seat. And then raise your hand. If you sit in the same seat every Sunday, raise your hand. You guys are a bunch of hypocrites. <laughs> Move. You need to sit over there, and you need to sit over there. You need to meet these people, and these people need to meet you. Quit sitting in the same seat playing the game of church. Oh, now I'm preaching, right? This is our body of Christ. Sometimes we believe what we want is what God wants, and what we need to understand is God wants what he wants. And it's for a family. We had 20-some people that are going to be joining the church in a few weeks, and what's awesome about that is they're new that's good. They're not old. They may be old in age, <laughs> but they're not old in eyes. And what they do is they come in, and you know what fresh blood does to the body of Christ? It rejuvenates it. It, it brings purpose, and it brings hope. And it's not saying, well, I can't sit here, or I can't sit. I hope somebody sits in your seat. I hope they make you move. Get off our comfort zone. Do something great for God. In Matthew chapter 6, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have your reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their rewards. If we do things because we want to be puffed up and arrogant, God is saying, okay, you got your reward because they appreciate what you did. But when we do things because God calls us to do it, when we minister to people without to, well, let me tell you what I did today. No, just serve Jesus. Give to the hurting. Speak to the wise. You don't have to tell everybody what you're doing. That's why Facebook, sometimes everybody tells everybody what you're doing on Facebook, right? Well, you just received your reward. Do things because you love God. Not because you want to stand at the synagogue and do loud prayers. So everybody say, oh, Pastor Bruce is real spiritual. And you would say, you don't know him very well. Because nobody is better than anybody else. Nobody is more intelligent and more spiritual we're all sinners that needed a relationship with Jesus Christ. And if we relieve that and believe that, God can do great things through us. Number four, rigid rules are more important than the love that liberates us. Rigid rules. Back in the day, that was called legalism. Anybody ever came from a church of legalistic mindset? Okay, God help you if you did. God bless you if you didn't have to go through that. But legalism has killed many faith. They have walked so many people out the doors of the church because of legalistic mindsets. Now, I'm not saying conservative mindsets because I'm a very conservative communicator, but I do not want to be legalistic. Here's what the legalistic communicator says. I don't like it. You shouldn't do it. If I don't agree with it, it must be wrong. I shouldn't have an opinion on what I believe or what I think. Do you know who has the final say-so of what the church should do? The Word of God. 
And if the word of God does not communicate it, my opinion is mine and I should not communicate what I believe to anyone and neither should you. But while we do have the mandate, we are God's ambassadors and we should say, you have a volitional will. You can say and you can do whatever you want. But I need to be honest with you, this is what the Bible says. And if I tell you what the Bible says, I don't want to agree with you or disagree with you. Who I want to agree with is God. And this is what the Bible says. And if you are a child of God, and I'm a child of God, we are his ambassadors. We use his word. Now, I can have empathy for you. I can say things for you and to you to make you feel good. It doesn't change the fact of what the Bible says. And just because you get my approval doesn't mean you get God's approval. Because it's my opinion. And we have to grow up in our homes to understand that it's not about our opinions. It's about what God wants within our life. And number five, reliving the past is more important than re recognizing God in the present activity. Reliving in the past. Sometimes when we live in the past, we think the past would be the best days. Because the older we get, the less of the good days we have left. I get up in the morning, I'm like, oh, man, I'm getting old. But, amen. <laughs> but sometimes living in the past spiritually would say, my best days were behind me. The church's best days were behind me. And what we have to realize, God is in control of the church. And if we think the best days of the church and the best days of your life is behind you, we're not putting a focus on what God wants to do through you. Because there are people all around us that we cannot be pharisaical towards, but we have to have compassion towards. And because of our age and because of our mindset and because of what we've gone through, we have the privilege into the future of speaking the truth. Are we always going to do the right thing? No. None of us are. But what we can do is be open towards God and say, you know what? Today, today, I want God to use me. I know what he's done in the past, and those were great days. Believe me, when I first came as your pastor here, there were some really good pastors that came, that were pastors here before me. And I first came in, I said, I can't. I can't live up to that. And I couldn't live up to them. And I had to say, you know what? It's not about what Glenville did in the past. From, somebody gave me a, a plaque today from 1956 to 1981. It was great days in the past. But I got here in 1999. Guess what? I was not in control of what took place. Good and bad. What I have to take on from 1999 till whenever God calls me home. My responsibility is to pastor this church with a pure heart. My job is to pastor this church preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified my job is to preach humility, love, and grace, and get rid of legalism, and let people know that Jesus Christ is the priority within this church. And somebody give me an amen. amen. If it is about anything else, I, as your pastor, have failed. We want people to see Jesus Christ. We want people to say, tomorrow is better than yesterday. Yesterday, I was in sin. Yesterday, I was falling apart, but today, I had an encounter with Christ. And because I had that encounter with Christ, tomorrow is going to be better than anything I have ever achieved in the past. Ask God to forgive you. Ask God to forget your sin. Cast it behind his back and say, today is a brand new day. Sometimes churches are hindered because of their faithfulness of their past. We used to do it this way. We used to run this. We used to have this. And when somebody does something different, it's not like what we used to do, so it must not be the right thing to do. And God says, I want to give to you a new song, a new life, a new breath, a new ministry. The old things have been passed away, become I make all things new. And sometimes we rebel against that. We need to take every thought captive. And the last one I want to spend a little bit of time on. Preserving a religion is more important than expressing your life. 
you're not just a Christian. You're not just a Baptist. You're not just a Methodist. You're a child of the Most High God. You have been adopted into God's family. You are His righteousness. It's not about a religion of rules and regulations and things that we should or should not do. I've been adopted. I have been unwanted in this world. I have been cast aside to the philosophies and the directions of this world. And God said, in your sin, I'm going to forgive you. Am I worthy of that? No way. But God is. And God said this, I am going to send my son and he's going to die on that cross and he's going to shed his blood for you. Bruce, for you. You can't look at anybody else. You can't see that he is worse than you or you're better than him because we're all sinners that need a relationship with Jesus. One sin cast us out of the direction of Jesus. But because of what he has done for us, we've been adopted into his family. Preserving a religion. When Jesus came to this earth, he had one job to do, and that's to die. But in doing that, he broke the temple up. He cast the Pharisees aside. And he said, my church will never be about rules, regulations, and rituals. Things you have to do to be honored to God. Because when Jesus came to this earth and he died, he said this, my dad sent me here so you can be part of my family. It's not about rules and it's not about what you have to do or what you don't do. It's about do you have a relationship with Jesus? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross? It's not about how many books of the Bible that you read or how much money that you give or your attendance in church. When you go to heaven, God's not going to say, what member were you at and how often did you go to church? And I, I want you to come in all the time. But Jesus says, do you know my son? Do you know what I did for you? Because it's not about religion. It's not about the name over the door. It's about the heart. In church, we have to have a heart for people. I have said this for 20 years now. I make a lot of mistakes. I err in a lot of different areas. But I will never err on the side of people. People are going to be my mind. They're going to be my heart. And if somebody needs Jesus, I will leave the spiritual. I'll go into the carnal. And I will love them out of their carnal into the spiritual. If we don't have that mindset, we come to church and we expect them to be like us. And I say this, sinners are supposed to do what? Sin. Christians work childlike fellowship. And guess what? You sin. And we have Jesus. So what we have to do is we not make a religion so overwhelming that we have so many roadblocks that people can't get to Christ. We need to break down the roadblocks, the sacred cows, the issues of our faith that are not biblical. And we need to say this. We need to open up our doors and say, Jesus is here. I want this church to be all about Jesus. I want our lives to be Christ-like. I want the Word of God to be paramount. I don't want a church that's legalistic. I want to be a church that's biblical. I want to be a church that speaks the truth. I want to be a church that will never stand against the very Word of God. But I don't want people to be hindered because of the practice of the church. I want them to say, I 
need that. I need what you're preaching. And the Holy Spirit of God comes alongside them. And you hear something that somebody else hears. And you get something different than what somebody else gets. And that's the Holy Spirit prompting you. And when the Holy Spirit of God prompts your heart, that's God's touch of saying, I need you to do something for me. It's not about a religion. It's not about being Baptist. It's not about going to church. It's about having a touch of God within your life and being who he wants you to be. Let's go to work. Let's go to prayer. Lord, I ask you within our hearts and within our lives to forgive us. Every one of us have failed you miserably, but you have never failed us. You've loved us in our sin. So Lord, forgive us again. And let us as a church always remember what you've done for us. You've adopted us into your family. We couldn't get there any other way. But because you love us, you take care of us. You've adopted us. We want to say thank you. And Lord, give us the ability to get into other people's lives. Not to be better than them, not to be over them, but to have empathy with them and to bring them to a point where they can see Christ. Lord, we ask you for that. We need you to do that. We ask you that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.